This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. I try to be very fluent. <laughs> first, of, first of all, I want to thank the organisers for invitation to this workshop. And... Um, I want to say how pleased I am to be here and have this opportunity to listen to these diverse presentations and to take part in this interdisciplinary workshop on motherhood. Also, saying this, I need to say that the novel Beside the Sea by Veronique Olmi is a sad book to read and the task to contemplate motherhood through the novel is hard because of strong emotions the novel provoked in me as a reader. How does infanticide and the novel relate to motherhood? Is there even any link between motherhood and infanticide? Also, it is the mother who is guilty of killing her children. Should this act be linked better to the serious mental illness, to the touch of the evil, than to motherhood? Nevertheless, my quite immediate insight into the novel was to highlight and reflect on three different themes related to motherhood. These three themes came to my mind while reading the book and when receiving Jill Rice and Ruth Kane's excellent, insightful and thought-provoking papers. Or another reason for these three themes results from my dissertation from year 2009, which concerned maternal responsibility and changing relationality at the beginning of motherhood. First, I think that the novel speaks particularly about maternal isolation. Second, the novel is about the context of the culturally dominant narrative of intensive mothering. And the third theme relates to maternal ambivalence. These three themes were also discussed in a nuanced way in Chills and Ruth's papers, as we just heard. I found both papers so well written and Jill's paper bridging the novel and the theoretical considera considerations of the mother's voice and maternal ambivalence and Ruth's paper illum illuminates the role of the law and psychiatry in social and moral di dilemmas related to filicide. Thus I try to make my points very briefly and to raise some ideas or questions for the general discussion. I begin with a very brief summary of the infanticide or filicide in Finland. Infanticide is a very topical issue also in the Finnish society. There have been such cases more than on average and they have provoked a wide public discussion. From April 2011 to April 2012, altogether 12 children have been murdered either by the mother or the father of the child. There are only about 5.5 million inhabitants in Finland and thus the number of cases is rather substantial. The latest case, case in which the killer was a mother happened in November last year. It was just on Thursday this week when the newspapers in Finland told about the nine years long prison sentence of this mother. The reasons for killing f her three years old and three months old daughters related to the revenge in a divorce situation and exhaustion when caring for the children alone. The news told that the mother couldn't seek help for her in that situation. Uh, Ruth even expected an increase in filicide because of increasing economic austerity and a governmental mandate for the moralized privatization of caring responsibilities. There are direct quotes, quotes mm. sorry, <laughs> but <laughs> to be short. So qu questions why and what reasons are behind these drastic, desperate and final acts arise when hearing these kind of seemingly irrational acts. The novel Beside the Sea offers one path to approach these difficult questions. The narrative is meaningful in many senses. Paul Ricoeur has brought out that the mean, by the means of the language, experiences at the same time disclosed, understood and given shape. Furthermore, Jane Elliott emphasizes the social nature of narratives for social sciences. Social can refer to the fact that narratives are often told to somebody or to an audience. 
Thus, Veronique Olmi's novel, regardless of or right because of being fictive, creates meanings and forms a basis for understanding and discussing this phenomenon, which is often highly private, secret, unspoken, and for outsiders difficult to approach, to understand, to comprehend. In the novel, maternal isolation becomes visible by the means of describing the events with a focus almost solely on the mother and her two sons. There are other characters who she feels judge her mothering and uh, they are more like a threat, as Jill pointed out. There are not any friends, not any close kin or the fathers of the boys mentioned as offering a, any emotional support or concrete help to the mother. The mother is alone and tries to cope alone. Uh, Ruth asks in the end of her paper, and I quote, uh, would the outcome have been different if the woman had received support whether from family or wider society? And would she have accepted this support? Just said that. Uh, and Jill wrote in her paper that, and I quote, the mother does not seem to be able to express her despair to these who can help, or perhaps no one allows her, to, her the space to do so. Um, is it the mental and social isolation of the perpetrator and the family that is often connected to these kind of tragedies? Thus. Uh, more general question would be what the proper ways are and how to offer support for mothers. The dominant narrative of intensive mothering can be considered partly to explain isolation. In this dominant narrative it is precisely the mother who has the responsibility, responsibility over the children. Susan E. Chase discusses the divide between good mothers and bad mothers. Some mothers, for example, young mothers or lone mothers, as the mother in the novel, that is, the mothers departing from the ideal, are considered easily in the public and professional discourses deviant and questionable. Motherhood becomes often discussed only in terms of good or through the dichotomy between good and bad, right and wrong. This polarization generates divides between women. This polarization and divide is visible in the novel. The mother, mother compares her actions in relation to the other mothers, in relation to the ideal motherhood. And as both papers pointed out, how easily mothers become stigmatized when departing from the norms of ideal motherhood. The ideology also prohibits women from seeing the structures that have created motherhood as a female ideal and standard. In this context, Ruth referred in her paper to an infanticide and filicide researcher, Michelle Oberman, who has said, and there is a quote, there is a shame inherent in confessing even a minor struggle with motherhood. Women are expected to cope with and in e indeed revel in motherhood. And Ruth says, said in her paper, there is also shame implicit in recognizing the fragility of mother love. Jill highlights the existence of maternal ambivalence in the novel. She argues that the tension between protection and possession is at the center of the mother's inability to manage her ambivalence. The mother's possessiveness was illustrated in both papers today and interpreted as forming one flip side of maternal love. According to many feminist researchers, the other polarities that can give rise to ambivalence are as follows. There is maternal isolation versus maternal community, dependency versus agency, expansion of self versus loss of self, the experience of power and omnipotence versus the experience of over overwhelming responsibility in seeking to fulfill the fantasy of the perfect mother, life destruct destruction versus life promotion, which relates to the volatile and aggressive feelings that may arise in the mother-child relationship. Also, this involves caring and loving aspects as well. Jill refers to Rotsi is it Rotsika? Park, Rossi, Parker, and how she has divided ambivalence into bearable and unbearable ambivalence. Parker sees present-day idealized expectations as the main reason for the unbearable ambivalence experienced by women striving to be good mothers. 
Parker has cited in Jill Rice's paper argues that in our Western culture there is no acceptable language to which to acknowledge or handle this ambivalence. The only ac acceptable and safe way to admit its existence is through humor. Selma Seven, who is, in, who is the researcher who researches the ethics of care, warns about discounting the shadow side of care. She names such factors as the existence of conflict, aggression, ambivalence, and discordant feelings and experiences related to care. In this way, Veronique Olmi's run, novel runs counter to the motherhood ideal and shows the shadow side of care. Chill suggests that the novel contributes to the cultural awareness of maternal ambulance, the lack of acknowledgement of it, and the dangers of continuing to obscure it from view. So, it might be good to discuss what the what might be the other means to bring up and to speak about these diverse aspects of maternal amb ambivalence and how to do that discussion that goes beyond feminist uh, research and feminist audience thank you, thank you.